I would invite you to turn in your Old Testament scriptures to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. We're familiar, of course, with Exodus 20, the giving of the Ten Commandments, even perhaps with Exodus 19, Israel gathered before the Lord at Sinai. The book of the covenant in chapters 21, 22, and 23, there is a a very interesting account of Moses and others going up the mountain to meet in a special way with the Lord. So Exodus 24, I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Now he, that is the Lord, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood And put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we have come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Our New Testament reading comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. We'll start with the last verse of chapter 16 and read the first eight verses of chapter 17. Matthew 16, starting with verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. 
And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. We'll stop there. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I did last week, why are we in this passage? I asked that question last week, and I ask it again this week, and there are three reasons. First, it continues the text that we examined last week from Matthew 16. We're not planning a series here, but I wanted to touch on several passages from Matthew related to discipleship. And Matthew 17, the transfiguration, is an important account related to discipleship. And in fact, in some church traditions, in the month of August is when they celebrate this glorious account in our Lord's ministry. And we, of course, don't know when exactly this would have taken place, but that is the tradition in some churches. And I would further suggest that, although I don't know that we have to set aside a special day to celebrate the transfiguration, perhaps we do not give it sufficient attention. Rightfully, we focus on the birth of our Lord. We have all sorts of celebrations related to his birth. We give attention properly to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But there are other events that we do ignore. We perhaps do not give proper attention to them. In fact, we might say we celebrate more the Holy Feast of the Super Bowl than we celebrate some of these events in the life of our Lord. So the transfiguration as we know it was a powerful proof that as our Lord announced his suffering, as he announced all that would take place to him in Jerusalem, he would suffer not because he was weak or helpless or powerless. That was not the reason why he would suffer. No, he would choose to suffer and die for us. I stated last week, the foundation of discipleship is the glory and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called by his grace. It's only by his grace that we serve him. And we are called to keep our focus upon his true glory. The glory that is revealed in his word, the glory that one day will be revealed. Jesus announced that. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. That's verse 27 of Matthew 16. Well, importantly then, before Jesus went to the cross, he gave, we might say, a foretaste of his glory. He gave to three of his disciples, he gave a foretaste of his glory to them. So the call of our passage from Matthew 17, let us keep our focus on the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on his glory as you seek to follow him. We're first going to look at verse 28 at the end of Matthew 16, and then our focus will be on chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. But note again verse 28. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Our focus last week was on the three demands that Jesus made in terms of discipleship. First, that we would deny ourselves, that we would take up our cross, that we would follow him. Those are the three demands. And then we noted Jesus gave three reasons for those commands. That those who seek 
to save their lives. They will lose it. Those who lose their lives for my sake, they are the ones who will find it. As Jesus reminded us, what profit is it if you gain everything in life, but you lose your own soul? What will you give in exchange for your own soul. And then Jesus also in verse 27 announced, he will return. There will be a day of judgment. So three demands, three reasons for his commands. How does verse 28 fit into this text? I think we can say it is the conclusion, both in terms of discipleship, but also in terms of Jesus announcing his coming suffering. Some of the disciples would see Jesus coming into his kingdom. The language there, the Son of Man, the language of verse 28, I believe we should connect with Daniel chapter 7. The vision of the Son of Man coming before the Ancient of Days. Some of the disciples then would see clear evidence of Jesus coming into his kingdom. They would know his suffering and death would not be in vain. In fact, this would be part of the basis for their call to follow him also to the point of death. Now, how do we understand this expression, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? Well, clearly this cannot be his final or second coming. That clearly is not what Jesus is saying. The apostles, the disciples are all dead. It had to be something within the lifetime of at least some of them. Some have suggested we are not to see just a single event. The Son of Man coming in his kingdom could potentially refer to all that Jesus would face, including his coming suffering. Remember, Jesus doesn't just talk about his suffering. He says... In verse 21, he will be raised the third day. Of course, he would be raised in a glorified body. He would be, or he would ascend to the Father then 40 days after that, and then the Holy Spirit would come another 10 days after that. So there are a number of very important events. They may signal the Son of Man is in his kingdom. Now, there are those who say, well, we should look for a more single event, and so some have suggested the judgment on Jerusalem in AD 70. Some of the disciples were still alive in AD 70. And then another possibility is the transfiguration itself. We'll note that further. I don't know that we can argue definitely for one position, but here's the bottom line. The disciples would be given clear proof of who Jesus said he was as the Son of Man. The disciples would have clear proof that all nations, all peoples, all languages of the earth belong to him. That, again, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So, in a sense, we don't need to know exactly what verse 28 is referring to in that we have abundant proof given in the word of God of all that Jesus claimed to be. And that is why we follow him, because he has given abundant proof. He is the Savior. He is the Son of Man. That is his basis for calling us. Again, we then declare Jesus did not die because he was weak or helpless. He willingly gave himself for us. The great shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. We can also say the call to follow the Lord Jesus Christ then is not the call to become a wimp, a pushover. No, the call is to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that does mean, as we have talked about, self-denial. It means that we take up our cross. It means that we keep our focus on him. And so may your focus be on the Lord Jesus Christ, his glory and grace. 1 Peter 2 20 and 21 says this, For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called... 
because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. By God's grace, Peter identified fully with the call of Jesus, didn't he? And that is the call given also to us. And we are to know with assurance the Son of Man has ascended. He has been given all authority and power in heaven and earth. He has revealed his glory to us. That is our focus. Well, secondly, we consider how Peter, James, and John, three of the disciples, were given a foretaste of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us consider briefly each of the eight verses that begin Matthew 17. Now, as you look at verse 1, I would ask the question, what are two details given in verse 1 that might give an answer to chapter 16, 28 in terms of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? What are two details that may say maybe it is the transfiguration that is the evidence of that? Well, the two details are first the time marker. After six days... There's a clear time marker, which you do not often find in the Gospels. So attention is drawn to when this event took place in relationship to the last part of chapter 16. Peter's confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the Lord announcing his coming suffering. So after six days, Luke says about eight days. So a week later, we can say, this event. And then Peter selected only three of the disciples. In verse 28, verse 28, there are some standing here. And then in chapter 17, 1, Peter, James, and John, they are the only three that are taken up on this mountain. So it may be that chapter 17 is the fulfillment of chapter 16, 28. There are details, again, we cannot be dogmatic on, but it's a possibility. Now, Peter and John especially would play a very important role in the canonization of the New Testament. We'll note more of that later. Now, verse 1 also tells us Jesus took them onto a high mountain. Now, do you have the name of this mountain in your scriptures? And the answer is no, the mountain is not named. We do not know the mountain. There are high mountains in that area of Caesarea Philippi where Peter made his confession. There's Mount Hermon, which is about 9,000 feet in height. That would, I think, qualify as a high mountain. The traditional site is a lower mountain called Mount Tabor. There are two churches that have been built on that mountain, but it's not told to us. We need not be concerned about this mountain other than it is a high mountain. And I think more importantly, we are to think about how does this account relate to other accounts in Scripture? We read from Exodus 24. There is definitely a connection with Exodus 24. Also, as we turn earlier in Matthew, in Matthew 4.8, in the temptation of Jesus, we read, The devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain. I don't think we're going to say that's the same mountain. But the fact that Jesus is taken in Matthew 4 onto a high mountain where the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Here Jesus takes his disciples up on a high mountain where his glory will be revealed. We are also, I believe, to connect the baptism of Christ And this account. Following Christ's baptism, he is tempted. Following the transfiguration, Jesus also would be given an even greater testing. So I think most importantly, we are to consider how this text connects with other parts of Scripture. We read in verse 2, simply, Jesus was transfigured before them. Jesus was transfigured. The word in Greek is where we get our word metamorphosis. It's used several other times in the New Testament. Jesus was transfigured. That's the English translation that best fits this concept. What do we mean by transfigured? Here's a definition I would suggest. The transfiguration was the temporary removal of that which kept the true glory and divine nature 
of the Son of God from being seen by all men. The transfiguration was not a change in Jesus, but rather it was that temporary removal of that which kept his true glory and divine nature as the Son of God from being seen by all men. In Exodus 33, this is, is the account where Moses wanted to see the glory of God. And remember what God told Moses, Exodus thirty-three twenty. God said to Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. No man can approach God in the fullness of of his glory and remain alive. Now, do we see at all the glory of God? Of course we do. Everywhere we look, we see God's glory in creation. But in creation, we do not see the fullness of God's glory. If we did, we would all be dead. Remember after Jesus' first miracle where he changed water into wine, we read in John 2.11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. In this first miracle, Jesus showed his glory. Who else could take water and turn it into the best wine? So in various ways, Jesus showed his glory. Think of all the miracles. Jesus walking on the water. Jesus calming the storm, the waves, and the winds. So throughout the ministry of Jesus, he showed his glory. The transfiguration, we can say, was a fuller manifestation of the glory of Jesus Christ. It was an even greater showing forth of his glory, pointing to the much greater fullness still to come. The fullness of what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. So the transfiguration then was not a change in Jesus, but rather it allowed Peter, James, and John to see more fully the true glory of that Jesus enjoys as the Son of God. And this account is written for your benefit. This is given for us so that you will direct your attention also to his glory as it has been revealed. Now, how do we define the glory of Jesus Christ? Well, in part, it's defined in this passage. His face shone like the sun. His clothing became as white as the light. So it's a picture of this brightness, this exceedingly great brightness. The only thing we can compare it to is the sun shining in its strength. Now, as you read this account, you're not going to come away with the same feeling, the same response as did the disciples. But that would be like trying to explain to someone that you visited the Grand Canyon. And in ten words, they're going to feel the same thing you did as you stand on the edge of that mighty canyon. So we're not going to have the same physical, the same visceral response. That's not the point. It's the truth that matters, not the emotional response we have reading this passage. We can't reduplicate that, but we can believe what has been revealed here. Remember, John would again have a powerful revelation of the glory of Christ. The Apostle John was privileged to see amazing things about the glory of Christ. In Revelation 1, 16, here is part of that vision that John was given, that Jesus had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And then his countenance, his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. That's Revelation 1.16. You see how close it is to Matthew 17 and verse 2. And then our attention in verse 3 is drawn, Behold, Moses and Elijah 
Moses and Elijah appeared to Peter, James, and John. And these two are talking with Jesus Christ. Now we have to remember the account of the transfiguration is told from the perspective of the disciples. It's their perspective that we have in Matthew 17 in the other gospel accounts. Now Luke 9 and Mark 9 are parallel accounts. In Luke 9 we read that Elijah and Moses were having a conversation with Jesus about his coming suffering and death. The most important thing they could have a discussion about. We would love to have a record of that discussion. But that, we are told, is what their focus was. Now, why Moses and Elijah? I don't know that we can say we know absolutely sure, but there are things in Scripture that point why Moses and Elijah. Moses prophesied the coming of Christ, did he not? And we are also told that before our Lord would come, Elijah would come again. Not literally, but in the person and work of John the Baptist. And so both men, Moses and Elijah, clearly pointed to the coming of Christ, the Messianic age. Both Moses and Elijah also went up on Mount Sinai. We read about Moses going up a number of times in Exodus. But remember, Elijah also went to Sinai. It's called Mount Horeb. But it's the same mountain where he also met with God, was given a glimpse of the glory of God. Both men also suffered rejection and hostility from those to whom they were sent. They prefigure the rejection and hostility of Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah, then we can say, are two of the greatest men in the Old Testament. Now we know that Elijah never died. He's taken up into heaven Moses did die. We read about this in Deuteronomy 24, 5 and 6. Somehow, though, Jewish tradition at the time of Jesus believed Moses did not die. Now, how is that possible when the scriptures are so clear? Well, that is a thing about tradition. But what a beautiful picture, though, is given to us of the unity, the harmony, the focus of God's word. Moses and Elijah meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ, discussing his coming death and resurrection. Now, Peter, as we might expect, speaks probably when he should not. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Some suggest maybe that should be read as a question. Lord, is it good for us to be here? Most translations, though, have it as a statement. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The word tabernacle could also be translated as tent. It's the word that describes how the children of Israel on the Feast of Tabernacles would build little structures. Out of branches and shrubs, they would build booths or tabernacles. Now, Mark and Luke tell us Peter did not know what he was saying. So what did Peter mean? Well, we can say Peter did not know what he was saying. Now, we're also told in Luke 9, Peter said these words as Elijah and Moses were parting from him. Some have suggested As Peter saw Moses and Elijah leave, he said, Oh, we want them to stay. Let's build these tabernacles. Peter maybe wanted to preserve the moment. That's a possibility, but in the end, as Scripture says, Peter did not know what he was saying. But here's the scene. Moses and Elijah are departing in terms of this vision. Peter starts to speak about how maybe we should build tabernacles For the three of you. And then suddenly, as Peter is speaking, this cloud, this bright cloud of God's glory and presence envelops, surrounds, or overshadows Jesus and the three disciples. So that's the scene. Moses and Elijah are leaving. Peter is speaking. And suddenly, the cloud of God's glory and presence surrounds the mountain. Again, a connection clearly with Exodus 24, 
and many other places where we read of the bright cloud of God's presence. This is not just a cloud that happens to blow by because they are on some mountain. No, this is the presence of God. And some church fathers said we are to see this as an expression of the Holy Spirit. And that may be a good way to understand this. I, I believe we are to see the transfiguration like the baptism of Christ is the work of of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the cloud may well be an expression of the glory of God, the glory of the Holy Spirit. The words the Father speaks in verse 5, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The first part of the words of the Father are the same words spoken at the baptism of Christ. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then the command, hear him, we should link to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Moses, remember, prophesied the coming of Christ. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Clearly a connection with Deuteronomy 18.15. Hear him. Essential, especially for these three disciples. In light of all that Jesus was teaching them about his coming suffering, death, and resurrection. They needed to believe and receive the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, these words, hear him, do they not speak to all of Scripture? All of Scripture being the word of Christ. And we'll talk more about the authority of Scripture in just a moment. The three disciples did what in response to this awesome scene? They did what any of us would have done if we were there. They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. So that's an appropriate response. To be in the presence of God, to hear the voice of the Father. I've mentioned before how Sigmund Freud and supposed other supposed experts have theorized religion has been invented because of the fear that man has of nature. Religion is invented because of man's fear of nature. Well, Sigmund Freud and others are missing the demonic aspect of pagan religions. Maybe, in part, it is true for false religions. They have been invented out of fear but we consider this, the triune God we worship is far more awesome than any part of creation, any force we see in creation, as mighty as the forces that we see in creation are. Scripture teaches us they are nothing in comparison to the fear and reverence we are to have before God. And so truly, we serve an awesome God. And this text reminds us of the glory, the awesome nature of the God we serve. Far too often, we do not keep that in the forefront of our minds, do we? The awesome nature of the God we serve. Absolutely holy, just, and righteous. This text then reminds us this is the God we serve, but praise God also for his grace, his compassion, and his love. Jesus comes alongside his frightened disciples. What does Jesus speak to them? What does he do to them? He comes to them. He touches them. He tells them, do not be afraid. So rightfully, we are to keep in mind the awesome nature of God, but we also keep in mind in Christ we are not to be afraid. In Christ that slavish fear is driven out. Instead we come as the sons and daughters of the living God. That's a much different fear. Look at the beautiful ending in verse 8. When they, the three disciples, then had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. The vision has ended. 
The glorious cloud has left. The disciples are now back with Jesus as they had been. Listen to the comments here of Donald Hagner. He says, Moses and Elijah were no longer to be seen. As they had played their respective roles in the history of salvation leading to this point in time, so now too they, returning to normal experience, must yield to Jesus, who alone remains on center stage, who alone is to be a herd, who alone can bring salvation history to its goal. It is that human Jesus whose glory now recedes again until the resurrection who alone can accomplish the will of God through the cross. Everything else was over, but they could see Jesus only. Jesus would fulfill all that he had declared. Well, consider three points in conclusion. This text, again, is part of the proof. It confirms that Jesus is indeed our Savior. And also that following him to the point of death is not in vain. Following Jesus as he calls us, even to the point of death, is not in vain. And so we see the foundation of discipleship is not human determination. It is not the human spirit that we celebrate. It's the glory of Christ. That is what calls us. And we know that our labor then in Christ is not in vain. But we also should consider this. Every time we are reminded of the glory of Christ, we should consider how much we are nothing. How everything that we do must be done in humility. It is one of the sad factors. It's part of the fall in our life. That when we are focused on serving the Lord, that's when we are most tempted by pride. Tempted to think highly of ourselves. Tempted to think, well, look at me. That's why God has used me. Look at all that I am doing. How can anything we do compare to the glory of the Son of God? Such that we would hold up our own work in comparison to the glory of Christ. We know it is so easy, though, for men to point to themselves. For churches for pastors, for anybody to say, look at what I do, look at what I have done. Utter humility. How can anything we do ever compare to the glory of Christ? Now, we know that our labor in Christ is not in vain. But in our own strength, what could we ever do? So always in humility, always keeping our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the path of discipleship. Second, the words of the Father, hear Christ, confirm indeed all that Christ has revealed to us, his entire word. Now significantly, Peter, James, and John are called to be with Jesus. Peter we're more familiar with. James and John were cousins of Jesus. You may remember some of those details. And remember what they were called, James and John. They're called the sons of thunder. The sons of thunder. And we have elements in their lives that maybe reveal to us why they were called this way. In Luke 9, 54, James and John wanted fire to be called down from heaven on a Samaritan village. And in Matthew 20, just a few chapters after this, the mother of James and John come, comes to Jesus and asks Jesus, give my sons positions of honor in your kingdom. So they had a nature that we might understand why they were called the sons of thunder. They might have well been boisterous and, and self-seeking in some sense. But I think that term, the sons of thunder, should not just be understood in a negative way. Ernest Martin, in his book, points this out. To be called the sons of thunder also refers to the calling they were given to boldly declare God's word. And we know that both James and John were used in the service of the Lord. James is one of the early martyrs. He bears witness to the word of God in his death. John has the privilege of living longer, we believe, than any of the other disciples. Not that he lived this easy life, but John then plays a vital role 
in the canonization of the New Testament. The longest living, we believe, of the disciples. And listen also to Peter from 2 Peter 1, refer back to this event, to refer to the transfiguration as a key element in his witness. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Jesus knew very well what he was doing in taking Peter, James, and John with him on to this mountain. They had no idea of what they were going to witness, the significance of that. But it is part of the witness that the word of God is indeed true. We receive it as the very word of Christ. Hear him receive his word. Well, third and finally, throughout the word of God, we are called to set our minds on things above, to set our minds on God's glory, the glory to come. This vision did not last very long. It came and it went. So we must live by faith. We don't see that blazing glory of Christ in our everyday experience. By faith, we must believe and set our minds on these things. We read or we studied Not that long ago from Colossians 3. Let me read Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When we looked at this passage, we said this does not mean you join a monastery where all you do all day is contemplate heaven. Rather, this passage has application in terms of the false teaching in Colossae where there were those who were tempting the believers to turn from the truth to turn to all sorts of man-made traditions and ceremonies. And Paul is saying, no, you've been raised with Christ. You follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage cannot mean that all we ever do in life is think about heaven. That would be an impossibility. We do have our regular lives. We do have things that are important on this earth to do. But how do we fulfill this passage? First of all, frequently we do consider the glory of Christ. That we set our minds on things above so that we do have the right focus, the right perspective. That we are careful that our attention is not being set by just the things of this earth. The glory of this earth. Rather, your priorities your determination of your service. It is set because your mind is focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The glorious truth is this one day, my friends, and it's not that far in terms of how man judges time. We don't know, but it's not that far in terms of eternity. When we will see the glory of Christ in a way that we can only have a foretaste of. Right? It is not that long in terms of the scheme of eternity when one day all who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will see God in Christ in a way that is indescribable. We keep that as 
our focus. We don't understand this now as we one day will, and yet this hope. Colossians 3, 1 John, this hope is given to us, not as an invitation to mysticism, but as an invitation that we frequently think about this in terms of our service. Indeed, as John says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. This is part of our calling to turn from sin, to turn from the foolishness of this world, because our focus by God's grace is on the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. By his grace, may this be true. May his word fill us such that we do set our minds on these things for the glory and honor that belongs to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth, your word of truth. We thank you that we can believe every word that has been given to us. We are to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to hear him speak now in his word. Thank you for the full assurance that we can have of your word. Thank you for the full assurance that we have that our Lord did suffer, but that he was raised again on the third day, that he has ascended, that he has entered into his kingdom, and that one day we will see His glory, the glory of the Father. We want to have the right perspective and focus as you have called us. Enable us then by your grace to set our minds on things above. We pray this for the glory and honor that belongs to you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.